Welcome everyone to the latest webinar from Flight Global to examine the impact of the coronavirus crisis through the eyes of aviation industry leaders. I'm Max Kingsley-Jones and I'll be your host today for the first webinar uh, on, our, on the leasing sector, which we are presenting in association with aviation consultancy and data business IBA Group. I'm delighted that we are joined today by two highly respected leaders from the leasing sector. So I'd like to welcome Feroz Tarapur and Robert Martin, Chief Executives respectively of Dubai Aerospace Enterprise or DAE and BOC Aviation. Uh, Feroz joins us from the UAE and Robert from Singapore. Welcome to both of you. We're also joined by IBA Group President Phil Seymour, who will be providing a little bit of data context to our discussion as well as his thoughts on the way forward. Before we start, a quick bit of housekeeping. This discussion is time for about one hour, 15 minutes. And while I have a big pile of questions for our panel, we'd also like to try and answer as many of yours too. You can type them in using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, but you can't see other open questions and I'm sure we'll get a large number. My colleague, Murdo Morrison, who is Head of Strategic Content at Flight Global, will be selecting the questions for me to pose. I'd like to point out that the intention of this webinar is to take a broad and high level view of the leasing sector, rather than get bogged down in the details about aircraft values and the like. There's plenty of other webinars who have already done that. So uh, I'd like to welcome um, Robert and uh, Phil and uh, Firoz. And if I could ask, uh, by way of introduction, uh, if the two uh, lessor CEOs, uh, Firoz and Robert, could just give us an overview of your, um, your businesses, and then we'll hear from Phil for some scene setting. So uh, over to you, Firoz. All right. Uh, thank you, Max, for uh, having us. Uh, we'll keep it, uh, I think, relatively brief, but just to set the stage for kind of our footprint. Uh, today, we own, manage, and are mandated to manage just over 400 aircraft. Uh, and of the own book, uh, our composition is a little bit different than um, some of the larger lessors in that narrow body by value is uh, only 50% of our fleet. A wide body passenger is about 30% of our fleet. And then we do two different things. We do um, the 777 freighter. Uh, which is 13% of our fleet. And then we do our one non-jet asset, which is the ATR 72600, which is 7% of our fleet. And each of those, as, we, as we've seen, has shown some very different uh, operating characteristics in the last couple of months or so. From a regional standpoint, uh, you know, look, we have 114 customers in 56 countries. And when we look at uh, the spread, uh, Middle East and Asia Pacific's ex China, ex um, India, are about 25% each of our business. Europe and America is, is about 15% each of our business. And China, India, and Africa are about 7% each uh, of our business. So that's the split in terms of um, carriers, et cetera. Approximately half of our fleet is on lease the flag carriers, which carries a different dimension in this particular uh, marketplace. And from a geographic perspective, our top five clients are UAE, Bahrain, China, India, and Russia. So very good kind of emerging market footprint reflective of who we are and what our customers are. And uh, in terms of kind of forward looking commitments, um, we have exactly zero aircraft on order uh, at this point from either Boeing or Airbus. So that uh, is a simplistic dimension for that. Let me keep it brief. I'll stop there. And if, if you or others would like to dig in, happy to do it during the session. Uh, thank you, Firoz. Uh, Robert, uh, obviously your, your business has been around for many, many years under different guises. And it's, uh, I think you're uh, certainly in the top 10 in terms of size, is it seventh at the moment in value? I'm not sure where you, where you currently rank. If you tell us a bit about uh, BOC, please. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, Max, many thanks for inviting us uh, to be on today. Um, so BOC Aviation has been around now for 27 years. And during that period, we've just passed two major milestones. We've just signed our thousandth lease commitment 
and we've committed to more than 900 aircraft now since we set up um, here in Singapore back in November 1993. Um, today, we basically um, have a fleet of 567 aircraft which are owned, managed and on order. And we lease those across the world to 92 airlines in 40 countries and regions. And all those numbers are as at 31st March. Uh, as you may know, we're a listed company on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, ticker 2588. And our headquarters are here in Singapore. Now the fleet is spread globally. Um, we're pretty well balanced across the four me major regions of the world. Um, and our order book is primarily focused on single aisle types with one or two aircraft, one or two of the white bodies uh, that we've picked up under our pre-delivery financing and lease structures. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much, Robert. And obviously we'll be talking a little bit more about the, um, the, the fleet situation as we go through the webinar. Uh, so I just want to now switch to our, um, our co-presenters here today, IBA Group. Uh, Phil Seymour is going to just give us a bit of a scene setting from um, from the virus perspective and, and some, some hopefully some green green shoots as well. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll hear from you now, Phil. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you're seeing a slide that gives a little bit of information about IBA. Um, in terms of my 44 years in aviation, uh, I haven't seen anything as drastic as COVID-19, both clinically and economically. Uh, for those of you who don't know IBA, let me introduce you briefly. Uh, we have a rounded view of the market, 33 years of data, managing aircraft, uh, remarketing aircraft, as well as being a leading appraiser. Uh, we won the Appraiser of the Year Award for 2020. Uh, I will never forget this year at all, will we? Um, with respect to aviation, travel and tourism, it inherently relies on the movement of people and it's been particularly harshly hit. The high capital cost of equipment, the infrastructure and highly trained staff mean COVID-19 has taken a brutal hit on the aviation industry. So let's have a look at the uh, next slide, please. The, the uh, so-called chart of the aviation cycle. I won't get too heavily into these lines, but here we show the influence of lead indicators such as GDP that that has on air traffic, both passenger and freight, of course. And at a very high level, that creates revenues and profits for airlines. In the past, they've ordered more aircraft and some time later take delivery. Operating leasing has played a key part in reducing that time scale from orders of new aircraft to delivery by providing both new and used solutions when capacity is required. Also, the flexibility that operating leasing provides to the airlines has seen a huge demand for leased aircraft and that has led to growth in the operating lease entities. But let's go back to the airlines by taking a look at uh, the next slide, please. Um, this, this slide, which is actually IATA data, does show that airlines in general have struggled to make money over lo the long term, as so much of their operations are outside of their control. And it was actually only from 2015 that IATA declared the industry worthy of so-called investment grade kudos. Operating lessors, well at least the ones here today, have decades of experience in managing their relationship with the airlines, not only in the good times but throughout the cycles. So although this chart shows how thin the profitability can be when compared to other markets that investors are attracted to, it's only in recent years that the industry has benefited from such high levels of return to the investors. That's on the airline side. Clearly now that is a significant challenge, if not for, uh, not for all, all airlines, but many of the lessors customers. 2019 did see an increasing pressure building on airlines the strong dollar was an issue for many non-US generating airlines, given that fuel and leasing is generally a US dollar exposure. And on the cost side, there's only a certain amount of cost that an airline can take out of its operations. Safety is paramount. Uh, we'll have a look at the next slide, please. Uh, this just brings up the, the subject of fuel price and interest rates. We take a close look here because interest rates are key given the huge investments required by the airlines and lessors to fund the sector and the influence of fuel price, which is often between 25 to 45% of direct operating costs for the airlines can have a huge impact on the airlines results. Um, so where are we now? Let's have a quick look at the next slide, please, because we thought we'd take a look at China uh, aircraft usage. Now, if we look at the, the green 
uh, bar, uh, sorry, the green, uh, green line on this chart. Um, although this is heading down, that's positive the way we've created this because it shows that there has been a reduction in the number of cancellations of the China domestic market. There's still large numbers of parked aircraft and there's a long way to go, but we do see some glimmers of hope here. Uh, in terms of setting the scene, I hope that's provided everybody with a, a brief view of the data intelligence platform here at IBAIQ. And I'll now pass you back to Max, Robert and Feroz for a deeper dive. Thank you, Phil. That's really interesting. We'll probably look at the, um, the influence of the fuel price or not perhaps on, um, on the way that the fleets are reactivated a bit later. I'd like to hear the, uh, the, le the leasing company's view on that. I thought for a, for a starting point, we'd look at the challenges that the leasing sector is facing. Um, obviously, some of them are not dissimilar to the airlines and a bit of audience participation. So we're going to actually do a poll question here and hear what, see what the audience think is the biggest challenge for the leasing sector. So if I could ask uh, for the poll question to come up. Uh, the question is, what is the biggest challenge for the leasing sector? Airline failures, retirements, early lease terminations, impairments, declining values, lack of demand for lease placements or something else. Just give you a few more minutes, a few more seconds to, uh, to vote. Okay, let's see the results. So uh, it's quite close actually between airline failures and lack of demand for lease plays. I suppose one and the other are, uh, are synchronized. From, interesting, we, we couldn't vote on that as the, uh, as the participants in the, in, the, uh, in the webinar, but I'd like to hear maybe um, for us, you could give us your thoughts on where the big challenges are. I mean, I'm sure it's all of the above, but where you see the, um, the, key, the key challenges for the sector. I was just going to say that the fifth alternative in that question should have been all of the above. Yeah. Because I think that one of the things that we are facing is a confluence of these risks that has come together. And I think, you know, it's fair to say that if you haven't seen these um, risks before, they can be intimidating. But to somebody who has been around and remember that our platform including the acquisition of AWOS is now around for 35 years in 2020. Um, you know, we have seen this movie before and whilst a lot of these things are happening at the same time, uh, airline failures, for example, is not something that we worry about now, but is, is what we consciously think about when we underwrite the lease. So if we've done our job correctly when we underwrite the lease, I think that uh, element is covered. I, th I think that the market is in a difficult uh, situation at the moment simply because of demand. But when that changes, um, you know, the underlying trends that supported aviation and they do support aviation are not going away. The only question is the pace at which they return to normalcy. And for those of us who have actively nurtured um, a strong balance sheet to be able to withstand exactly an environment like this where capital markets are not cooperative, clients um, have uncertain demand um, uh, and or fleet requirements. I think for us, we will be able to use that strength to be able to pick up our franchise presence and be ready for normalcy. You know, if it comes around soon, not so soon, late, uh, so, so I think this is, um, this is all to be expected. Nothing good, but all to be expected. Thank you, Firoz. Robert, your thoughts. Thanks, Max. Um, there is one thing that wasn't up there that I would have expected. To me, the most important job is to protect the health and safety of your employees. And I think in today's world, we have to treat that very seriously in leasing companies we don't have large numbers of people. Uh, we have small numbers of people and ensuring that we ensure their safety is number one, I think, in any leasing company at the moment. Now, just then 
moving forward. Let, let's just think about how this crisis unfolded, because I think this is important to understand what type of crisis it is. So the first thing is, it's a health crisis, okay? And that is what has stopped passengers flying. So clearly, it's a demand-led crisis, okay? The second thing is, compared to all other crises we've seen before, this was incredibly rapid. You only have to look at sort of how quickly traffic dropped off in China around the Chinese New Year period and then in other countries afterwards. And it's not only the drop off in bookings that occurred, but also the fact that a lot of airlines also had to handle refunds at the same time. And so this created a double whammy for our customers. Okay. And so I think the speed and severity of the downturn is where this downturn, I think, is different. And our feeling is this isn't a V-shaped recovery. It's more like an L tilted by 30 degrees, where basically very rapidly down, and then it's going to come back more slowly. And the more slowly then is driven by the second factor, which is the role of governments. This is a crisis in which governments play a much bigger role than we've ever seen in aviation history before. If you think about it, it is governments who have closed down borders to fly across. It is governments that have reduced visas and there needs to be a clear plan on how all of that is unlocked, okay? because that is going to determine the speed at which the industry comes back. And our approach to this has been, first of all, focus on airlines in the two biggest domestic markets in the world, China and the US. Why? There are three reasons. First reason is the size of the domestic market. And there are no cross-border issues to fly aircraft around internally within domestic markets. The second thing is, those countries also have the largest debt capital markets in the world. You know, if you look at what, what's happened in the US capital markets as a whole, not just airlines, but as a whole, $259 billion were raised in the month of March after we had two weeks of complete shutdown. That was a record sum. In the month of April, $285 billion was raised in that market. In the Chinese domestic market, we've seen 60 billion RMB raised by airlines alone. And so for those, for the airlines in those markets, yes, it started off as a demand shock, but by moving rapidly, they stopped it becoming an immediate liquidity issue. And I think this is important for how this unfolds. Obviously, then the role of governments becomes important because we've also seen the government support coming in. Uh, over $100 billion has now been committed to airlines around the world in the forms of grants to pay for their wages, in the forms of loans or loan guarantees going to airlines and equity as well. Now, some may come with strings attached, some didn't. But the key thing is governments move quickly this time to support the industry. We didn't see governments move quickly in this way in the previous downturns. OK, and so I think the, the second thing is the role of government. So then let's talk about the impact on us, the operating vessels. Clearly, uh, a lot of our customers were immediately hit by what's going on. They've come in and asked for help. But given what I've just said, it's not one size fits all. Some airlines actually didn't need liquidity because they already have access to liquidity in other ways. So actually, they are more interested in just doing purchase and leaseback business. And you may have seen we've done five billion dollars of that since COVID started. The second thing is, as we've addressed these issues, it's clear to us there's you can tell the experienced airlines who have been through something like this before, and I credit particularly the North American carriers at the speed at which they build to move their liquidity. In the same way, the Chinese carriers, the, work, the speed at which they tapped the domestic bond market in China. So again, it's not one, one size fits all. So we've been handling 
on the customer side, two things. One is new business, doing puts and lease packs. The second is handling their incoming requests. And those that need, definitely need deferrals, we've helped them with deferrals. Those that don't, we've maybe done other things for them. In addition to that, then as a leasing company, your Achilles heel is the liability side of the balance sheet. This has always been the thing that's killed lessors in previous downturns, where basically they either have, and go back to the days of Guinness Peat Aviation, um, where they had a huge debt balloon, if my memory is right, it was about $3.75 billion, which in those days was a huge amount, full due in the middle of the first Gulf War. And what that meant was they weren't able to refinance it. Think of flight lease, uh, which came after September the 11th, same thing, it was a refinance issue. And then a number of leasing companies who relied on short-term debt during the global financial crisis. So the key thing is to have termed out your debt and don't have big debt balloons falling due, because that is where you become very subject to what is going on either in the capital markets or in the banking market. And generally you will find a leasing company lags what is happening with their airline customers in terms of what is happening to them both financially and in terms of the impact on them. Thank you, Robert. And just going back to Veroz, uh, obviously Robert touched upon some of the mitigating or mitigation uh, factors that uh, he's been implementing to help his customers. Can you give us a little bit of uh, insight into what you've been doing to support your business uh, customers? Sure. So uh, we just uh, released uh, our earnings and the uh, press release uh, says that as of the end of April, we had granted requests for rent relief, which is principally in the form of deferrals. Uh, to 25 customers and the aggregate amount of that relief equaled 5% of annual total revenue of our company. And in addition to that, we are evaluating requests from 33 other customers and the sum total of that uh, relative to our annual total revenue is 10%. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. I think as Robert said earlier, there is no one size fits all solution to this issue. But the, the, the fundamental reality is that our customers have seen their revenue go to near zero uh, without exception. And in that case, uh, some of them will need legitimate help. Uh, our approach has been that if you come to us for relief, we will evaluate it on a case by case basis. We will discuss why it makes sense for us to do uh, what we're doing with you and how we can help you. Uh, it's gotta be a two way dialogue. And if we can identify something that works for both of us, we're more than willing to use this gigantic liquidity cushion that we've built up to ensure that our customers survive uh, and do the right thing by themselves and by us. So it's, it's been a deliberative, cooperative approach uh, <clears throat> to make sure that we uh, very carefully balance the needs of our clients and our own needs to make sure that we're here for our other customers tomorrow and to protect the growth of our franchise. Thank you, Feroz. So just a, a quick reminder on the housekeeping. We've got over 600 uh, participants actually uh, dialed into the webinar at the moment. So there's a, a lot of interest in this subject, obviously. And um, we're, we're seeing the questions coming in. If you missed my intro at the start, the, uh, the way to ask your questions is to put them into the, the Q&A uh, box that you'll see on your screen. And uh, you won't see anyone else's questions. So there are quite a lot of them already in there. We'll come to some of those in a little while. I've got a few of my own still to get through. Um, the, the leasing sector is responsible for up to 40% of all the aircraft that are going into service, either through, through factory orders or, uh, or through sale leasebacks on delivery. So I think um, our two CEOs would probably be interesting to hear their views on, um, on how they see the, uh, the delivery outlook for this year. Uh, and who knows what the, uh, the answer is. It's a bit of a, a finger in the air at the moment. So I thought we'd actually ask the... Um, Ask the audience on this one. So we have a poll question, which is uh, 
about uh, the deliveries. Uh, how many Airbus and Boeing jets will be delivered during the whole of 2020? And just for uh, a yardstick or benchmark, the, the first quarter, which wasn't really affected too much by uh, uh, COVID-19, there were 172 deliveries. So the, the, the options are fewer than 600, 600 to 1,000, 1,000 to 1,400, or more than 1,400. Now, obviously, the virus aside, the, uh, the situation with the 737 MAX and whether that comes back this year and, and, and how much comes back this year is a big part of that still and an, un, an imponderable probably as well. But be interested to see uh, what people's best guess is on this. Okay, can we see the results, please? Fewer than 600 or and then maybe a few thinking that uh, up to a thousand. So how do you, what would you think to that, Robert? Do you see that? Uh, have you got, got any kind of take on what you think the numbers could be? I know it's a, a real guess at the moment. Okay, let me begin with some background, if you don't mind, Max, before yeah. I give a number. Sure. Because I think it's very important to understand. I'm sure when everyone looked at that, they were thinking about the demand side. But there is also issues in the supply chain. And the issues in the supply chain will also impact on the number of aircraft that can be delivered this year. Obviously, all the way down the supply chain, companies are having to adjust to the new reality. You know, Airbus went down from uh, roughly one third in terms of the total deliveries. And COVID, unfortunately, has meant that a number of the factories have either had to close down or they've had to change the way they work in the supply chain. Remember, there's tens of thousands of companies in the supply chain. And if you're short of one part, your aircraft can't deliver. So, so we have to take both sides into account. On the demand side, uh, obviously, if you look at where the orders were supposed to go to this year, a fair number were due to go to low cost carriers, who are the people who haven't been active in the debt capital markets or in the equity markets so far during COVID. So when I add those two to get things together, I think we're at the lower end of the 600 to the 1000. Thank you. That's a really good point you make about the supply chain. Uh, so maybe the demand and the finance issues will uh, will actually alleviate the pressure on the supply chain so uh, it might actually be a benefit and then so from um from Feroz's perspective i'm just curious what you what numbers you would you concur with robert on that i think robert kind of summed it up really nicely uh, i think from our perspective um the next two months are fairly critical uh in everybody not just us everybody making a determination about the effectiveness of this partial reopening that we see around the world. Because if there is a setback, or if the new normalcy is leave the middle seat blank, or some other uh, distancing and or social behavior mechanism that people can't get around, then I think that will have a, a fairly large and, and uh, negative uh, implication for uh, the rest of the year, but if the next two months go well, there, there is a potential acceleration uh, that we can see. So in many ways, I would say that given everything that uh, Boeing is going through and given all of these uncertainties, that it's hard to imagine this number getting up to be a, a very robust number. Thank you for us. Phil, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, you obviously keep a close eye on the way production is playing out from for your business. Yeah, um, I, I, I think you're right. There was already pressure probably on the supply side anyway. Um, I was going to say even forgetting the max. I mean, it's difficult not to forget that, of course, but I think we were probably at a creaking point in terms of those, the production and the, the logistics supply chains. I mean, it wasn't just... Um, the MAX, there was, there's been issues with some other engines entering into service. Even aircraft interiors have become a bit of a problem with completion of some aircraft. So um, I, I, I don't want to sound like there's opportunities everywhere, but I think the OEMs have really had to 
look at those supply chains. But as, as Robert has mentioned, you know, th there's no industry that's been untouched really by, by this pandemic. And you know, mobilizing people into that supply chain is really going to take some time. Um, so, yeah, I think in terms of production numbers, I, maybe, um, maybe I do see it being less than 600, but that's not uh, uh, a, that's a, a qualitative uh, comment rather than quantitative. Thank, thank you, Phil. Um, in terms of what will prevent, on the demand side, what, what will prevent the, uh, the airlines taking the aircraft or uh, at least being not just from a logistical perspective of getting to the to the delivery centers and stuff like that uh, what do you think the key this is a question for the two to, to leasing companies what what would be the um, the key drivers do you think that will uh, will hamper their ability to take delivery in the short to medium term will it be the fact they just don't want the airplanes or that they can't finance them uh, for us what's your thoughts well, you know, obviously it's uh, a little bit of both because um, on the one hand, uh, it's one thing to say that, uh, you know, we're flying again and schedule is this and that. But the, the other side of that coin is that you actually have to make money, which relies on uh, load factors and yields and all of the rest of that good stuff. And I think that capacity planning in that uh, environment becomes an exercise that is a you know almost a new exercise for a lot of these airlines who will be feeling their way around how well their customers adopt to wearing masks or, or other actions around things that we haven't really even fully explored whether it's catering or use of uh, toilets or uh, any of the other dimensions that will change from a week-to-week -week basis around uh, the risks of this uh, particular um, um, virus still kind of being there. So it's, I think to me, there is a, a, fair, a fair amount of unknown stuff that still has to be kind of sorted out. And if that falls on the right side of the equation, I, I think that is a clear enabler. Um, there are legitimate issues around uh, financing. I think that if you looked at the margins that were available before, and you tinkered with the cost of secured debt, which is pretty much the only thing that's available, with much lower uh, LTVs, much higher spreads, et cetera, some of these business models will have to look carefully as to whether they can actually make any money uh, by taking all that stuff. So to me, there's a, there are, um, there are kind of walls all the way through. Um, it, it will have to be a, um, uh, kind of a data-led uh, discovery process where people kind of figure out how much they can charge um, and therefore how many aircraft they need. And even if they can get the right number of people on board and charge the right amount of money for it, uh, whether they are able to get lessors uh, and or banks to enable the acquisition uh, of that. And I think it's different by region. So if you look at certain countries in the world, um, they're used to flying with a mask for the last 10 years. If you look at certain other countries of the world, that's a you know, completely new phenomenon and a phenomenon that may or may not uh, kind of take hold. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a lot of TBD, but to Robert's point, there is a earlier point, there is a distinct advantage of large domestic markets here where the ability to make decisions is enabled by a fairly large uh, kind of flying population that perhaps acts in a homogenous kind of way, but unique to that particular market. So uh, to us, it's a lot of TBD uh, as we look at the, the quite, um, quite dissimilar landscape out there. Thank you, Faroz. Uh, Robert, so from, from the demand side perspective, what do you see as the, uh, the main obstacles for the deliveries? <clears throat> okay, so Max, I think the first question you have to ask yourself is why was the aircraft ordered? Was it for replacement or was it for growth? This is very important. You will have seen announcements coming out of a number of the big flag carriers and network carriers around the world that they will be using this period to put older aircraft whole fleets on the ground and probably not return them to the market. Yeah, I think American came out talking about their 757s 
uh, and seven six sevens. Lufthansa mentioned their four engine aircraft, three forties, seven four sevens. They're going to put on the ground, and so clearly, if someone's taking out a whole subfleet, then they're more likely to take the planes to be ready to fly when basically we get through this period. If, however, this is a fast growing LCC that was doing this purely for growth off the back of significant market growth in emerging markets, I think then the situation is different. So that's the first thing. Second thing is where are they on financing? If they basically had committed facilities they can rely on to finance these aircraft, uh, then again, it makes the decision easier to take them. But remember, the market was extremely frothy, particularly in the personal leaseback market last year. And people who may have committed personal leaseback terms last year and turn up to finance the aircraft themselves this year may suddenly find that margin has reduced and maybe have disappeared completely between today's higher debt pricing versus last year's purchase and leaseback pricing. So I think we can expect that some of these commitments will fall away um, for deliveries this year, particularly on the single aisle side, uh, where they're going into emerging markets. The third thing is foreign exchange. Um, this is not an industry issue for the aviation industry, but during the first three months of this year, there was huge outflows from emerging market currencies and back into US dollars, which has driven a number of emerging market currencies down. For example, the Brazilian real, we certainly saw that happen. In South Africa, we saw that happen with the RAND. And this is something as well that suddenly changes the equation if you're taking these aircraft to put into domestic markets where you're, even when you start operating again, your fares once translated to dollars have dropped 20%, then it's going to mean you may want to reduce the number of aircraft you're taking. You may not need the number that you originally were due to take. You may want a much smaller number. So I think those are the things that are really going to drive people's thinking as to whether they still need the number of aircraft. And we think there will need to be a significant number of deferrals on the single aisle side. Thank you, Robert. And I guess you, you touched upon this with the, the, the trends we've seen from some of the big carriers. I think Delta's talked about their MB80s and 90s going as well, as another example. Uh, there's, a, there's been discussion about the fact we have such a low fuel price at the moment, whether there will be temptations to keep those written down airplanes in the fleet rather than have to find the money to, uh, to take new aircraft, which obviously deliver a lot more efficiency. Uh, and if the fuel price is higher, then you it goes much more directly to the bottom line. But you, you seem to think that the, that the trend is that people will actually still, when they can, take those younger aircraft, those newer aircraft, with, even though that the fuel price delta isn't so significant. Well, I, t I turn it around the other way, Max. I think when people look at fleets where they maybe have a lot of older aircraft coming up to heavy maintenance events, for what will be a very low value aircraft, why would you then spend a lot of money on maintenance? And maybe Phil's the best guy to talk through this issue because I know he does this in his day to day business. Um, but this is obviously something people are thinking about. And when they remove a whole sub fleet, then, then they're moving all their pilots, their attend flight attendants, and um, all their maintenance staff, then they'll move them off that aircraft type and move them on to other aircraft types. Yeah, I suppose if the aeroplane that you're acquiring is a bigger aircraft um, and you've got the, uh, the social distancing, it might actually also be a benefit like a, Ma a Max 8 versus a, a Southwest versus a 737-700. There's, there's also there's a lot of moving parts in this, isn't there? So, Phil, w w what's your view on that? Would you see, um, would you concur with, with Robert? Um, I, I do like the, the most used expression today is there's there's not one size fits all, of course, and, and this is the same in that maintenance sector. I think some airlines, probably the larger national carriers who have MRO facilities as part of their group, um, there could be uh, a thought that they, uh, they, they could continue with older aircraft. However, it's those airlines who've tended to make decisions in the last month or so <clears throat> about retirements. You know, Air Canada um, are taking some of the 
uh, Embraer's out, they're not exactly old aircraft, but uh, some of the, uh, uh, the A320 fleet, 767s, because it is such a, a high cost you know, burden on the group. Um, we're, and this sort of leads into the, the broader MRO industry, which uh, uh, could well be uh, another sector that, that suffers as, as airlines look to preserve cash. Um, you know, there's a, you know, those, you know, the typical narrow body engine shop visit could be up to five or six million dollars just for one engine. So I think there's going to be a, a lot of, lot of thought, each airline, each aircraft type and almost each specific aircraft will need some thought. Um, if the airline has been paying, I suppose, maintenance reserves, it might, might want to talk to the leasing company about actually, yeah, you know, can we, we we're thinking of doing these engine shop visits. On the other hand, uh, you know, there may be a discussion about, you know, not spending money uh, for those accrued reserves as well with the lessor. So uh, lots of moving parts here. Thank you, Phil. Uh, I think Faraz used the expression at the start that he, he's seen this movie before and we've been through these kind of downturns before. Obviously, this is looking more severe than any other one uh, uh, altogether, in fact. But uh, and it kind of comes to a question that we've had from one of our, uh, our attendees. I was curious about the way that the market has behaved in previous downturns, the, the leasing sector, and if we might see some more of that. And the question we have from Vishok Mansingh is, um, we expect to see consolidation in the airline space driven by the virus and the, the after effects. Will there be consolidation in the leasing space too? What's your thoughts on that, Faroz? Um, I, I, you know, look, we've said for the last three years now that the leasing space is due for consolidation. But the reasons that we had articulated for that two or three years ago are, of course, very different than the reasons that uh, we, uh, we would say now, but we would still say that. So before, you know, it was a case of people uh, providing uh, capital and liquidity with return expectations that were, I, I think, not globally consistent, not globally sustainable, and sooner or later, the day of reckoning would kind of come around because, you know, whilst you have an 8, 10, or 12-year lease, you can afford to bury your head in the sand and not worry about what's likely to come, particularly if you paid a really high price uh, upfront to acquire the growth they needed to establish something. This time around, uh, I think um, what will happen is that for folks who uh, are, I'll say newcomers in quotes, meaning in the last five to 10 years who've gotten in the business, um, there is a subset of that um, group that I think will come to realize the complexity uh, and the financial uncertainty of managing through a full life cycle of the aircraft. And while no willing seller, um, if they can afford to hang on, will exit at the kind of losses that we would that they would have to take at the current time, I would say that if they can afford to wait it out a little bit while prices recover, and they will, uh, they can have a calmer discussion within their own strategic envelopes about what risk reward is acceptable. And I think that this risk, this event that has happened has opened up a risk parameter that I, I can say with near confidence that was not uh, in the strategic envelope of some of the newcomers in the business. Ironically, whilst you're absolutely right that the confluence of risks has come together in a very different way. So no finance class I ever had in my corporate finance MBA said that the whole world would come to a stop all at once and all the benefits of uh, diversity, correlation, et cetera, would go out the window. Uh, it, it highlights the, A, the severity, but B, how calmly and efficiently the experienced platforms who have dealt with each component of stuff that has come together now can bring that experience to bear to keep their franchises rock solid and ready for the next growth. So I think consolidation is inevitable. The question is over what time frame, and the question is the pain thresholds, which are linked directly to the level of preparedness that is in the balance sheets for some of these companies. Uh, so that, that's kind of how we would think about it. 
Robert, you're, uh, you're very experienced, obviously, through several downturns now. How do you see this one playing out in terms of consolidation? Do you think there'll be some more? For, for okay, leasing, so, sorry. Yeah, for leasing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, Max, when I think about this, I break it into three different types of lessors. Okay. The first type are traditional lessors who basically are corporates. Um, and... What we tend to see, if we see consolidation that part of the market, it tends to be because the owner, for its own reasons, wants to sell out. So go back to AIG in the global financial crisis, CIT. So that, that's the first reason why they sell out. So, and so those are, and it may be because the owner has a core business which is different and they can make better returns in that core business going forwards. So, so, so I, I think for consolidation to happen, it's really driven by the owners of the company that's going to be sold. The other thing to watch out for is where we have these big debt balloons or maturities I talked about earlier. Sometimes that may force um, a leasing company into some type of restructuring with its banks. And from that point, that can end up in consolidation. If you think back to GPA all those years ago, if you remember, GCAS picked up a large chunk of it um, and consolidation took, took place in a different way. The second type of uh, leasing company are those airline-owned leasing companies. You remember those? Um, well, I don't think they'll survive this downturn. Um, I'm afraid this is a financial business and the airlines will retreat to their core business during this period. Um, because what you tend to find is during a downturn, people will defend their core business. And the third group, which is where it takes a bit more think is we've had an explosion of ABS vehicles over the last two to three years. As we go through this downturn, what happens to those? And it won't be traditional M&A at all. Um, it's more going to be a matter of, you know, sort of unlike a traditional leasing company who can add additional assets, they don't have that option or generally don't have that option. So how do those companies go through? And there is also a large amount of assets that are sitting in warehouse facilities that were due to go into ABS deals. What happens to those as well? So I think we're gonna see a lot of activity in that third group as well. You mentioned the airline owned uh, leasing businesses. Do you see those being uh, acquired by, by some of the big players in the leasing sector or how, how, do, how will those portfolios be? I think that's really started already. If you look at, you know, Norwegian's leasing company, CCB, bought a majority of their Airbus orders. Um, AirAsia's leasing company, BBAM, bought most of the assets out of that company. Uh, Lion Air's transportation really just became an in-house leasing company. So, so I think that trend has already started long before COVID. Thank you. Uh, I have another question from the uh, from the attendees uh no name on this one uh this one i'll put to Faroz firstly uh, how are lessors managing airline default risk and how confident are you in aircraft remarketing in the current environment yeah so i think Ilan, like i said before you don't manage default risk now <laughs> you manage default risk when you underwrite the aircraft by putting the right protection around uh, the transaction, which uh, is back to the fundamentals, you know, the price that you pay, the, the, the security measures that you put in place and, uh, and all of the rest of it, if you will. Um, and so I think from that standpoint, uh, it is no different than how we manage default risk on a day-to-day -day basis, except that the underlying circumstances are now significantly elevated. And uh, as you would expect, uh, our credit watch lists have um, a higher number of reds and ambers than they did before, and obviously uh, a lower number of greens than they have uh, before. Uh, I think that um, the re-delivery um, dimension is tricky because, you know, people can't fly, you, don't, you can't accept, you can't move records around. Having said that, we have uh, transitioned aircraft in the last month, month and a half or so, 
it is challenging, it is difficult, but we expect that to kind of change as well. We've novated a bunch of aircraft. We've actually uh, transitioned one lessee to another. Uh, it's happening, but I, I would say that it's really, really difficult. And we do expect that situation uh, to kind of change uh, for it to be a, a little bit more efficient uh, than it is now. And it is no question that if a major carrier, um, you know, I, I don't want to name names, but if, uh, and we don't have this, but if, if you had 10 to 14 aircraft with a carrier that was no longer working, um, you know, there, there would be an issue around transitioning those um, uh, to another um, carrier because of a demand to logistics. Uh, and, and I think that's still an issue that we need to go through. It's a case by case basis. Um, and, and we see signs of hope, but we also see signs of um, uh, the situation which must change for it to come back to kind of some level of normalcy. Thank you, Faroz. Robert, the same to you, same question to you. Uh, so, so let's just look at the overall airline landscape. Um, there's roughly 800 airlines in the world. 400 of them have less than 10 aircraft. And whether we like it or not, and frankly, they are weak credits. So there is definitely going to be casualties in that part of the market. Okay. Um, and as casualties occur, market opportunity will also open up for other carriers. So you've got to remember, it's not a static world. When, when something changes, someone moves into the space of the guy who's disappeared. The second thing I would just say as well is we have not seen many startups in our industry since 2003 to 2005. One of the reasons why I asked for Phil to kindly put up the chart on interest rates and on fuel cost is in terms of the environment from fuel and interest rates, this is a good time for those with money to think about whether they enter into the market towards the sort of latter half of this year and into next year. They probably wouldn't have been thinking about this last year because the market was very crowded. But as we get casualties, um, you will find that others will move into their space. Okay, so when it comes to actually dealing with um, aircraft that will come back, and we like everyone else, I'm sure we'll get some back. Uh, basically, you need to be prepared for that. So we have dedicated team. You know, our history have had to repossess 46 aircraft so far from different countries around the world. And we will continue to do the same. But it will take time to move those places. And there's various ways that you can incentivize carriers into taking those aircraft from you, be it through power by the hours or step rates as ways to get them back into the market. So that basically, as the carrier's business begins to grow, they pay more rental to the lessor. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Phil, obviously you've seen these uh, recessions in the past and you've seen the, the way the market's responded with you know, mass groundings and, and demand collapsing. Uh, and obviously the, uh, the short-term impact can be quite dramatic on certain aircraft values. What, what's the kind, of, um, the kind of warnings we've heeded from previous experiences that we must take into consideration when looking at the, at the kind of values on aircraft in these scenarios? Yeah, I, I mean, we've been fairly careful. We, we've seen some appraisers putting numbers out there about market value reductions, but I, I really think in the context of operating leasing, you know, you're, th these, these companies aren't going to sell a naked aeroplane. Um, their business models, are, I would say, are more around the base value concept, which is if there's still belief that these are long-term uh, there's a long-term underlying value in the assets, then I think the base value concept is, is something that should be considered. That was actually defined by ISTAT in the wake of the 1991 first Gulf War, where there were relatively large numbers of aircraft grounded. Um, actually, I was working for Air Europe then and, and lost my job. Uh, so I know what it's like. And I think the, the, the idea of base value is, you know, should you take such a hit and impairment on a such a high capital asset when if you can't reverse that impairment you know what, what where do where does the industry stand it may be more of an accounting definition but 
you know, base value was really designed to look at the long term. And I think uh, in investors in operating leasing companies, I, I would say, I would like to think have a long term view uh, rather than, uh, oh, oh my goodness, uh, we've now got to sell our positions. Because in any recession, in any industry, you know, selling in a downturn is not, not the way to do it. So we've been a bit careful. I know we are often asked, what is, the, what is the current lease rate? What is the current market value? We will provide opinions, but in the right context. If a liquidator asks us, I know Ernst & Young say, look, we need to sell some Flybe Embraers and Dash 8s, and we need to sell them in the next six weeks, there'll obviously be a pretty distressed value for those. On the other hand, if there was an airline or a lessor looking at a, a sell lease back uh, for a, you know, a, a six year lease, there'll be a different value on that. So um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging the question or putting my head in the sand. I'm just saying you just have to be very careful when you see the sound bites and headline numbers of you know, what's happening to, to market values. So, um, uh, and uh, you, you don't want me to tell you that we're, we're holding many, many value webinars over the coming weeks, but, um, but, but we are, but we're at pains to explain the context of each valuation. Uh, so I hope I didn't dodge the question, but um, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me to just bring out a random, uh, a value is going to drop by X percent because you have to understand the context. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Robert, uh, any thoughts on that or any thoughts on what the, the market changes that you've seen in previous downturns creates uh, for, for the leasing sector? Yeah, I think Phil made some very good points there. I think holding power is crucial to a leasing company. You never want to be a forced seller. And if you're a long-term investor, you should never be a forced seller. Now, unfortunately, not every market participant is a leasing company. You've got to remember, we're in the same market as banks who may end up repossessing planes, as Phil correctly said, where you may have an administrator or a liquidator looking to liquidate in short period of times. So distinguishing between those two, I think is, is very, very important as to where is someone a forced seller versus where they have holding power. Now, the one bright spot in all of this COVID is freighters. And why is that? Firstly, because a lot of freight over the last 10 years has been carried in the bellies of aircraft. But because those aircraft are parked, so it's pushing a lot more freight onto dedicated freighters. And in China in particular, we've also seen the demand rise, particularly for package freighters. And so that will drive over time demand for older 737s and A320s that can be converted to freighters. So that is another market that's sort of opened up during this coronavirus period. In fact, on that point, Robert, do you think that that could see an expediting of some other freighter programs that have been slightly hamstrung by lack of feedstock at, at the right price? Yeah, and I think your last point, Max, is the key issue, the right price. Um, and now, if there's a number of sort of subfleets being grounded, the beauty is they're all the same type of aircraft in the same spec, and they become much cheaper as a group to put through a freighter program. So yes, I think that will come. Thank you. Feroz, did you have any thoughts you could add to Roberts on, on, the, on the value situation and previous play, behavior? Just a couple of things. One is that, you know, I think both uh, uh, Robert and, and Phil are absolutely right that if you don't have to sell, the underlying uh, demographics suggest that pricing will be at a different level. Uh, it's just a matter of time. And if you can manage your franchise uh, successfully uh, by having the right liquidity and profitability metrics in place, that's a, that's a good thing. I think on the freighter market, we may have a slightly different point of view in that, um, you know, in my opening remarks, I said that we are a very large 777 freighter, uh, lessor. In fact, I think we lease more 777 freighter aircraft than any other lessor in this world because we like that factory fresh product 
because it delivers uh, an amazing uh, benefit to our operators relative to the workhorse that they used to have before, which is the 747, uh, four and, and even, the, even the eight. You know, we have never been, and this could be because we don't know enough about it, but we have never been big fans of uh, converted freighter programs of older narrow ones. And I think that freight for us is a double-edged sword at the moment in that right now it is absolutely guns blazing time. The, the pricing is through the roof. Uh, capacity is 100% uh, nearly all the time. Our aircraft are flying um, in an ungodly amount of or number of hours every day, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as belly capacity comes back, th this dynamic has to change because belly capacity existed and exists for a reason. So I think belly capacity in more fuel efficient aircraft is um, you know, not quite kryptonite, but, but there for the older kind of freighter conversion programs which the value has never really worked for us. And the only way is if somebody literally threw the ownership cost under the bus to do that. And even then from an operating and from an ESG perspective, which is now kind of more and more creeping into the consciousness and the vernacular of our industry, I, I struggle with that uh, over a uh, kind of decade, two decade type uh, horizon. Thank you, Faroz. I, I have a question actually, which I think you're probably very well equipped to answer. That's come in from one of the <clears throat> one of the attendees. It's from Asis Kumar Mahanti, and it's about the Indian market. And you mentioned that's one of your key markets. Uh, how much time will will it take Indian aviation to come back to pre COVID nineteen position? Eighty percent of the aircraft are in S or B mode in India, according to this this gentleman's questions. Anyway, uh, how are you going to support the Indian carriers? Uh, I, I think that um, in India is a is a tough one to call for us because a they are behind the curve in terms of doing all of the health and safety type things that uh, other countries have done. So I think that it's fair to say that with the population density that that country has and 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 where they are in the spectrum, uh, that it's really too early to kind of uh, uh, make a call on Indian aviation. But if you look at um, Indians themselves, their propensity to take risk is a little bit different. The risk reward equation is a little bit different. So once there is uh, some material progress on either vaccine development and or testing and or other safety measures, we think that load factors will um, uh, emerge at a faster rate than they might emerge elsewhere. Uh, but I think that other than one or two companies, the financial health of all of the airlines in India was never that great to, to begin with going into it. So I, I think that there will be some casualties coming around as a result of that. All of them uh, have, or, or a, a, a big number, have a very large order. Um, it is, uh, other than one carrier, it is Airbus country. So I think there's all kinds of uh, issues with India that are kind of yet to, to come to bear. The underlying numbers are still massively compelling. We all know that. I don't need to repeat that, but the number of people, the flying public, the, the growth in income, all of that. So then you look past it, it's all fine. Will all of them will be able to manage this um, if it lasts for longer than we think, if that's, I, I'm not sure that's clear. Thank you, Feroz. Robert, I'm not sure how much exposure uh, the EOC has in the, in the uh, Indian market, but do you have any thoughts on the sector? We do, we do. So we, we've been players in Indian market, and actually, ever since I came to Singapore in 1993, I've been dealing with Indian carriers. Now, Feroz has quite well covered the um, demand side, but I think we have to always think of two things. One is demand and the other is where does financial liquidity come from? And the big difference between, for example, India with over a billion people and China with over a billion people is the financial markets within those countries. China clearly has a very strong banking system. It has a strong bond market. I'm afraid India doesn't have the same. 
So this means then that they have to support their growth in different ways. And I think one of the big challenges for the entrepreneur-led airlines in India is how do they grow their equity capital base? And they didn't do it before the downturn. And now there's a real need for this. You know, there's a reason why Southwest is raising equity at the moment. And we're not seeing that going with the exception of what Singapore Airlines have done here in Asia. We're not generally seeing that happening in Asia and it should be happening. Um, this probably brings us to the point where it's time to roll the export credit agencies back out and they could play their traditional role as effectively lender of last resort. And this is going to be needed for a lot of emerging market carriers, particularly as well for wide bodies that need to be delivered over the next couple of years. And in countries where governments just aren't as strong as the Chinese government or the US government. So I believe now there is a real role for Exim and European export credit agencies to play that really they haven't been playing over the last two to three years. And is that for um, just for airlines or would the, the leasing sector be able to tap that? I think both is the answer. Um, you know, we ourselves probably not likely to tap into export credit now, but, you know, because we have access to the capital markets with our investment grade rating. But I think for those leasing companies that may not that have investment grade credit ratings, I think, yes, um, it should be applicable for both. Thank you. We've got about uh, just under 10 minutes to run on this and uh, just sort of as we work towards a wrap up, uh, just to point out, we've had over 60 questions. Um, we've got through a few of them and some of them have been covering points we've discussed. Uh, thank you for all your engagement. Uh, just kind of maybe trying to look to something positive as we, uh, as we exit this uh, discussion. There's, I think, about 14, our uh, last check, 14,000 plus of the mainline jets currently stored. Uh, the numbers have been fluctuating and there's, there's about 22,000 passenger aircraft in airline service, Airbus and Boeing. So a big pr proportion stored. And I just would like to hear from, uh, from our panel on how they see that, uh, that fleet unlocking itself over the next few months. Perhaps how, would it be the low cost carriers or would it be the mainline carriers? Just curious what your views are. I know no one has a perfect uh, um, you know, looking glass at the moment to, um, or crystal ball perhaps is a better word, to, to understand exactly what's gonna happen. But, you're obviously close to the market, so maybe Feroz could give us your give us your thoughts on that. Uh, so l let's preface this by saying that nobody knows. Uh, within that, uh, I think that it's a good guess that uh, if you put aside uh, carrier type, uh, that the large domestic markets will see uh, more of their fleet uh, kind of resuming activity, and then as we see more cooperation models like the kind that Australia and New Zealand are discussing, those uh, fleets begin to emerge uh, and, and kind of get back into service. I, I think that um, a number of airline CEOs from various parts of the world, um, literally all parts of the world, have effectively pointed to kind of the summer of 2022 as being the period uh, by which they see a resumption of activity that would be equal to kind of 2019 level. I don't think that's massively unreasonable because this is, as Robert said before, a health risk. People are going to think about not just safety, but their health. So it's not like whether something bad is going to happen to the plane, it's whether something bad is going to happen to them when they get on that plane. Uh, and I think that that will um, kind of take a longer time than I think at least it's in the vernacular now to unpeel itself and kind of go back to, to normalcy. Now, you know, human nature is we tend to forget things, but this is a pandemic is not an easy thing to forget. And I think that it will just take longer than people think uh, for um, people to feel natural uh, and be comfortable with the kind of load factors that we saw before this pandemic. Thank you. Phil, any quick thought from you before I ask Robert? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think the decision is, you know, when you ground an aircraft, you know, is it parked for short term or is it a long term storage situation? There are, I won't go into the technicalities of those now, but uh, I think the decisions will be, 
does, it, does an airline bring, let's say it's got 100 aeroplanes and it's grounded 80. The issue will be, does it bring 80 back and just operate them for a couple of hours a day? Or does it bring back 20 and get that utilization up and the load factors up? Um, again, that will vary according to the, the, the airline's route network. So I, I, I think it will be <clears throat> very complex. Um, I think we've seen, you know, the so, you know, British Airways, you know, putting a lot of aircraft out at regional airports. I imagine they will want to get those back to the, the main hub as soon as possible. Um, but there will be uh, decisions to be made. As you've seen, so, you know, talk about, you know, not BA not returning to Gatwick, converging, pulling out of Gatwick. So that will actually impact the uh, availability of slots at, at Heathrow as well. So I think all the airlines are going to have to um, look very closely at the, the schedules and the expected load factors uh, before they decide which aircraft will come out of storage and when. Thank you, Phil. Robert, your thoughts? So I think the main driver here is going to be two things. The customer and getting the customer comfortable with the travel experience and government regulations. They're the two things that are going to drive this. And what I mean by the whole travel experience is it's not just being on the aircraft, it's how they go through the airport, what checks do they need to go through, how long does that take. Um, then when they get on the aircraft, are they comfortable with the way they're being seated? And just take out the middle seat doesn't work. If you're two parents with a young kid, you want that kid in the middle seat. Okay, and certainly the other passengers do. Um, so so, so I, I, I think here it's a little more complex than just purely uh, take out the middle seat because you've got to remember, particularly families travel together. And so that may not be the best thing. So there's definitely something here for a maths whiz kid to, uh, to work out a program as to how best to space each aircraft before people get on it. Um, but also then hotels when they get to the other end. Um, basically, are they comfortable with sort of where they're going to be staying when they get there? And government visas, you know, are they going to have to apply for a new visa each time they travel? Or are we going to go back to the old system of having multiple visas, maybe over 10 years? So the way we see it evolving is freight picked up first. We're already seeing that certainly in China. I think we'll see that in other parts of the world. Domestic travel second, because there's only one government involved. Then we're going to get to a point of regional travels where countries have good bilateral relations or multilateral relations. Um, and then finally, the broader intercontinental. Now, this may change the way that the ecosystem of airlines in the world works, because remember, we've seen huge development of single hubs where people have focused on a single city hub before. The question is, in that new environment, how quickly can you get back to that system? So I think this favours domestic carriers over the single hub in a single country. Because if you're in a single hub in a single country, you've suddenly got all these bilateral relationships to worry about. Robert, thank you so much for that. Great bit of insight as, as ever. So um, with that, I'd like to... Um, to say thank you to everybody but first of all just a quick PR piece for our webinar uh, we this is our fourth webinar we're running a series around the uh, the, the virus and uh, you can watch the, the previous ones and this one and keep in touch with the future ones at flightglobal.com slash webinars there'll be updates on our program and you can, as I say you can watch the playbacks as well uh, we ended up having well over 600 uh, uh, participants uh, attendees on this at uh, at the peak and lots and lots of questions over 70 questions so thank you for all your engagement and sorry we didn't get to more more questions so thank you to our three panelists to uh phil to feroz and to robert uh, it's given us your time really appreciate it really great insight i'm sure everyone would agree with that and finally thank you to um my colleague murdo morrison for helping with the uh, the q a and also to andrew coston for doing all the technical in the background so from murdo and me and from our panelists thank you and wherever you are, please stay safe. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Thanks, Max.